so today uh, we are going to discuss about uh, national company law tribunal related opportunities in companies act uh, because what has happened is nclt under companies act there are many provisions which are relevant but only few are always hyped up like mergers acquisitions or likewise so this is an attempt to help you all that what can be the areas what can be the petitions applications which can be filed under uh, the companies act 2013 so uh, basically uh, this is the composition of nclt but before that i would like to give you a brief background about how this nclt came into picture uh, so basically nclt is the outcome of the iradi committee uh nclt was intended to be introduced in the legal system in 2002 under the framework of companies act 1956 uh but as you might be aware uh, due to the litigations which were there uh, with respect to the constitutional validity of nclt it went over a uh, long years and uh, finally it got notified under the companies act 2013 and uh, this is how the nclt came into picture before that if you must be aware of uh, there was company law bench and then there was bifr then there were certain provisions wherein you had to go to high court uh, so say a major amalgamation petition and so on so uh, it was a need that you know there should be some consolidated powers and uh, that is why this nclt has become a very much boon uh, because it is you don't have to run through a bifr or c under cica provisions or you don't have to go to high court and so on so this has become a very essential tribunal and of course it is a quasi judicial authority uh, which is specialized in dealing in corporate disputes so it can be of civil nature obviously under the companies act of course it has got powers uh, with reference to the insolvency and bankruptcy code also so if you must be aware that there are a lot of petitions applications which are being filed under the companies act uh, plus of course the insolvency bankruptcy code as well so uh, after uh, the constitutional validity of the ncl to, nclt was upheld so supreme court categorically up, uh, upheld the constitutional validity of nclt and uh, because there were objection that you know certain provisions were considered as violation of constitutional principles and so on so that is how this nclt came into picture of course it is a it is like a normal tribunal uh, and it is obli obliged to uh, fairly and without any biases so all the principles of natural justice become applicable to nclt proceedings also so that is a pre prelude of how nclt came into picture and now we will just go through what is the composition of nclt so basically if you see nclt uh, is comprised of president who is uh, who is or has been a judge of high court uh, for at least 5 years uh, then there is a judicial member also uh, so he or she can be a judge of high court or a district judge for at least 5 years or at least uh, or he or she can also be an advocate with 10 years of practice and of, and again there is one technical member also so this uh, technical member is uh, can be of icls or ils and has been holding the rank of secretary uh, he can be a practicing ca or practicing cost accountant or practicing company secretary also but with an experience of 15 years or more or a person of special knowledge in law uh, industrial finance so basically if you see it is all related to corporate Uh, to understand because if you see it is not just about law it is also about numbers it is also about uh, many aspects involved in uh, company uh, law litigations so that is why this becomes very important that a person with such uh, knowledge is also a technical member uh, so that is how the composition of nclt is so if you see uh, the good part is there are many benches of nclt uh, so if you see the principal bench is in delhi and of course if you see there are almost all uh, major cities do have nclt bench uh, so there is new delhi then ahmedabad so basically central uh, region 
uh, western northern and southern region all our eastern region are also covered uh, so mumbai bench is there then again jaipur indore katak so all this if you see metro cities plus tier 2 cities are also covered and that is why it is also a very good scope for people uh, to practice uh, with nclt uh, because it's being it's not that you have to uh, run only to the metro cities so tier 2 cities also most of the tier 2 cities are also covered under the benches of ncl so uh, this is a quick flavor for you to about the case status statistics uh, the source of this is from the nclt website also the nclt website is a very user friendly uh, website and if you see there are orders and all which you can get immediately on the nclt website so if you see this is the only statistics of mergers and acquisitions from the year 2016 to 2022 so if you see uh, there are large number of cases which are being filed uh, with nclt and if you see the disposal ratio is also very good uh, compared to what we have of uh, pen- pendencies with the other courts and civil courts especially if you see um, there are a lot of cases which are being filed uh under uh, section 230 232 of the companies act 2013 which deals with mergers and acquisition and uh, uh, there is also a lot of scope in this area also and uh, there are other areas also which we will be discussing so if you see these are under the various provisions i'll help you with the provisions uh, that is 241 242 basically if you see 241 242 it is operation mismanagement uh sections under the companies act 2013 and section 397 398 was a erstwhile companies act 1956 related provisions to operation mismanagement so even if these are the uh, important matters because operation mismanagement is such thing which is uh, uh, which is an exclusive remedy if you see applicable or available only in companies act uh whereas llp and all it is not available but this is one of the advantage that if you are in a minority then you can approach and if obviously if you will fulfill the criteria under section 244 of the companies act 2013 and of course if it is 241 pro related aspects are there or 242 related aspects are there then you can approach nclt for that matter and this is an extremely useful remedy which is being availed by many shareholders and especially in minority of course this can be availed by majority shareholders also uh, but there are many cases which are being filed under these sections and of course there are other sections under 59 271 uh, which we will be going through so if, if even if you see uh, these these are the max, uh, many cases again being filed and the disposal rate is also good uh, amounting to 80% of the cases which are being disclo- uh, disposed so that also shows that these are uh, the pendency of these cases though yes it is not that that super quick uh, with ibc coming into picture and ibc eating a lot of time of nclt benches but yes this is nevertheless uh, a very uh, valid tool in the hands of the shareholders this nclt proceedings how does this go so basically uh, they are not bound by the civil procedure court uh, since this is a tribunal it will be relying on the principles of natural justice if you are aiming to practice in uh, nclt then of course you should be very thorough with your companies act 2013 or if it is the insolvency and bankruptcy code uh, if you are going to uh, have a um, applications and petitions filed under that code uh, and of course the rules made there under as well so basically the principal act companies act insolvency bankruptcy code the rules and regulations are very important and a working and a practical knowledge of all this will definitely help you in appearing before nclt and taking up matters under uh, this uh, code and basically the law uh yes uh, by powers it has got the powers of civil court though it is a tribunal and of course any order made by nclt or nclat that is the national company law appellate tribunal may be enforced uh, in the same manner as it was a decree of a court so this is uh, that's why people uh, this is also one of the lucrative options of uh, practicing before nclt uh, so basically those who are budding lawyers and who are willing to aim for nclt 
uh, this is a specialized and a very demanding uh, and a field wherein you can have your practice grow and of course all proceedings are judicial proceedings because it is ultimately a tribunal formulated under the companies act whenever there are uh, the suit as like you know the powers of civil court uh, the same are being applicable to nclt proceedings also so uh, there can be summoning enforcing of attendance of a person so sometimes directors are being called upon or ex auditors are being called upon for any examining them on oath or shareholders or related persons are being called on so discovery and production of documents so Uh, especially in operation mismanagement cases and all there is a lot of documents which the other party may not reveal or the other party may keep on holding that information and document and uh, by a uh, court order we can enforce or require the discovery or in production of such documents uh, it can be the minutes of meeting it can be the board meetings it can be the share certificates so such kind of uh, discovery and production of documents uh, can be uh can be the obviously the powers of nclt uh then of course subject to the provisions of indian evidence act requisitioning any public record or document or record or a document from any office uh issuing commissions for the examination of witnesses uh this is again since you are lawyers so uh, you will know uh, how a witnessing of examination of witnesses and everything is being done and uh, dismissing a representation for default or deciding it ex parte then setting aside any order of dismissal of any representation for default on any other mat matters which may be prescribed so basically if you see uh, there are many powers which are being granted to nclt and of course the nclat and uh, this would be very essential in the cases where uh, like i said about operation mismanagement where there are many intricacies which are being involved and if you are aware that how the Uh, provisions of companies act are framed and how you can use that provisions to help your client attain the objective then it can be uh, then you can definitely uh, best utilize the powers of nclt and avail remedies for your client so who can uh, represent before nclt uh, now since uh, nclt it specifically authorizes under section 432 that uh it's not just a prerogative of advocates uh, but you will see many chartered accountants in practice or uh, practicing cas or practicing cost accountants also representing before uh, the nclt because that is the inherent power given to them and it is no more a prerogative of only lawyers in nclt so if you see the crowd or if you visit any time nclt you will see mix of uh lawyers and pcs and pcas as well uh who would be uh, defending their cases and representing their clients uh in form of india uh, insolvency bankruptcy code or in terms of any company law petitions also okay yes so now what we are going to do is i am going to uh, take you through uh the provisions or where the references of nclt you will find it in the companies act because uh, what has happened is there are many sections in the companies act uh, which talk about that you can go to a tribunal you can file an application or uh, you can uh, file a petition and avail remedies with respect to that so i have tried to consolidate these sections and i will try to uh, help you in 2233 uh, two, two, three, three lines that what is this uh, section about and how you can avail a remedy i am not addressing any specific uh, section in detail because the idea is to help you that uh, nclt and companies act is not just about mergers and acquisitions or operation mismanagement but there are many uh, sections in the companies act which says that okay you can go to tribunal in case if you are stuck up here okay so that is how i am going to help you with some sections uh, with respect to uh this that how you can avail the remedy under uh, and go to nclt in that respect so if you see the first uh, section was section 2 sub section 41 it was related to a financial year as you know under the financial year under companies act is considered as 1st april to 31st of march earlier it was being mentioned that you can go to tribunal if you want to change a financial year 
uh, basically wherever there are foreign uh, subsidiaries and they want to do the consolidation of their accounts in accordance with their entities situated outside india then it becomes very easy if they have the same financial year uh, so that was provision was there but now that powers have been delegated to the regional director so you no more have to go to the nclt but you can go to the regional director uh, then there is one section which is section 7 su subsection 7 where you can uh, make an application to the tribunal if you believe that the company has been incorporated by furnishing false or incorrect information or by fraudulent action. So uh, basically, if you see, this is all about uh, sometimes it can happen that a material uh, facts are being suppressed or the promoters or subscribers have given some false or incorrect information. So if it is about a false of uh, documents which are being presented, or uh, declarations which are being made, which are apparently such that they are suppressing certain facts or uh, fraudulently being taken, then of course you can avail this remedy. Uh, this can be sometimes because of involvement of promoters or subscribers who are party in committing such fraud during the course of incorporation. Uh, so that is why this remedy is a very important thing and uh, it can be availed uh, and of course, NCLT can uh, cons will consider that whether what is best in the public interest, or it will also make uh, the ba uh, basic feature of any private limited company is that the liability of the members would be limited. But in such cases, uh, if it is being observed, or if the NCLT opines that this company was incorporated by furnishing false or incorrect information, or uh, then of course it can make that liability of the members unlimited or it can uh, give orders with reference to removal of the name of the company or it can straight away uh, order winding up also in such cases so wherever uh, somebody is being cheated uh, in terms of fraudulent information and that is being uploaded uh, at the time of incorporation then you can definitely think of availing the remedy under section 7 subsection 7 the next we go to is uh, section 14 one again it is being uh, delegated to regional director uh, conversion of a public company into private company so i will skip that then we can go to section 55 subsection 3 so uh, here like i said why uh, you should understand companies act uh, if you are willing to represent before nclt is because um, there are various uh, sections which for which you must be aware of the basic knowledge so um, now if you see this section 55 subsection 3, it talks about redeemable preference share. So you should know what is the difference between an equity share and a preference share. Uh, what are the rights of preference shareholder? Uh, when does the preference shares become redeemable? What are the terms and conditions uh, which are being uh, issued uh, with for a preference share? So all this you should understand. And then you can, after knowing all this, you can suggest the remedy to your client uh, with reference to sub, uh, sub section, uh, section 55, subsection 3. Uh, so it is basically if, if the company, if you see, is not in a position to redeem the preference shares. So this is about redemption of preference shares or the, uh, as you know, that the preference shares or also there is a dividend which is required to be paid and they are being given a preference over equity shares. Uh, these are the essential conditions of a preference share. So if there is a default in uh, payment or the redeem, uh, redemption is not being done by the company of the preference shares, even if now they are uh, up for uh, redemption, then of course with the consent of holders of at least three fourths in the value, uh, you can go to NCLT and uh, the NCLT can further you know, give such orders that the same preference shares which are up for redemption be a further equal amount along with dividend. Since preference uh, shares also get dividend, uh, so along with the dividend, the same uh, be further issued uh, and those orders can also be given. And if somebody is not consenting to that, then of course uh, their redemption can also be allowed by the NCLT. Uh, so there are... Uh, if you see from a documentation perspective, 
uh, while filing such applications with the tribunal, uh, there is a prescribed list sometimes under the NCLT rules or the section prescribes that what all uh, essential documents you should be attaching to your petition. Uh, so basically in such cases, now if it is redemption of uh, preference shares, uh, which are which the company is not redeeming. So then it goes from the basics, like what is the capital structure of the company? Then what are the classes? What are the provisions in the memorandum of articles, uh, memorandum and articles? Then what are the number of shares which are being issued, which are not paid, which are not redeemed? So all these uh, things will uh, be required so that you can make an application to the NCLT. Plus there is also this section 58, three and subsection four. So as you all know, this is about uh, transfer of shares. So uh, it is whenever there is a transfer of shares, as we all know, again, like I said, the knowledge of companies act will come into play that uh, transfer of shares, whether it is of a private limited company or it is of a public limited company. And uh, what are the provisions of articles of association if there is any investor which is there in a private limited company and that is how the articles of associations are being drafted. So what are the uh, restrictions or what are the ways in which the transfer related provisions are being drafted in the articles. So all this you will have to analyze and then uh, considering the uh, entire scenario uh, you can uh, go for uh, remedy under section 58 and sub of subsection 3 and 4. So basically it is of uh, in case of a private limited company. What if there is a refusal of registration of shares or in case it also happens sometimes that uh, when there is transmission of shares. So say some uh, shareholder in a company yeah, is deceased now and uh, say there are two, pa two kind of uh, parties who are holding say 49.51 kind of uh, ratio of percentage shares involved and say this one person holds 51% and the other holds 49% and say if there is a unfortunate death of 51% holder of share capital and now if now since uh, there are board members who are refusing to record now since uh, say as per the shares are going to his daughter or son for that matter. And if the company is refusing to have it on record, because if the person has been deceased, he will not be able to vote. Uh, he will not be able to attend uh, the board meeting if he is also a director of the company. And in such cases, if the other party is taking advantage of this situation and they are trying to increase the share capital of the company or they are not trying to include that person's heirs in the operations or business of the company then these kind of sections will come handy to you and even if despite you have given your papers or you have submitted the documents for uh, transfer of share uh, transmission of shares in this case and if the company is refusing or not paying heed to your documentation then you can avail remedy under uh, this section uh, so that is how the uh, the court uh, in such case can provide you an interim orders also, which can be injunction, because if there are some major decisions which are being taken in uh, this period within which the transmission is to be made effective, then of course such injunction orders can also be given uh, by NCLT in these matters. And uh, plus it can be again, uh, dismissal or direct it can dismiss your petition if it is not valid or it can direct transfer transmission also and or redirect the company to pay damages also if there is something which has caused that so depending upon the nature of private and public company uh, within the prescribed time limit if you do not receive that the company has refused your transfer or transmission then you can avail remedies under section 58 or 3 or 4 depending upon the type of company and the nature of transaction. So this rectification of member is again, uh, so if any person is without sufficient cause, so as you know that the register of members is a very important uh, document or important register because that is how you can show that you are a member of the company and your all rights which you are being accrued as a member, like right to vote uh, in a meeting. Uh, so all this get affected. So that is why if 
this register of members is not being maintained in a way that or it is it does not reflect that you are the member in the company or you are uh, you were earlier entered into as a member of the company but then later on it was being omitted then uh, by reason which is obviously uh, not right then in that case you can avail this remedy uh, of section 59 subsection 1 uh that by which you can go to nclt and again interim orders can be granted a uh, injunction uh and incidental or consequential orders also can be granted uh, in terms of payment of dividend because if you are not uh, as a member on the record then maybe you will not get dividend in that case you may lose the bonus shares rights or you may you lose the rights issue so all this we will, will lose because you are not being shown as a member in the company and such consequential orders or incidental orders can also be given by the tribunal uh, saying that no if it is proved that uh, it was the case fit case that uh, of uh, 591 and your your name was deliberately removed as a, a shareholder uh, from the register of members so this uh, this is also a typical uh, case uh, or sometimes also in operation mismanagement cases where the registers uh, where the members are being pushed out of the company or they are their shares are being transferred and so on so this is a very important uh, provision which you should not forget then yes 611 is a entire subject in itself uh, because it is about a uh, consolidation division so all these are very uh, important uh, important uh, important section in terms of restructuring of capital so restructuring of capital like i said it is an exercise in itself uh, and there are various aspects by which you can consolidate your shares you can divide your shares or you can change the voting percentage of the shareholders involved and all this you can do it effectively by going to nclt and availing the remedy under this act so restructuring of capital again uh is a very important thing and especially if the company is into losses for a, a long time then then all the considering all the balance sheet aspects so that's why i told that it's not just about law it is also there is accounting involved there is taxation angle to it also so whenever if you see companies act there is interplay of many uh, laws also and it is not just a decision under companies act because it's going to have the repercussions under income tax it's going to have repercussions in your accounting and that is why this has to be holistically looked like this consolidation restructuring of capital or say merger amalgamation it's an financial transaction also so it is about the company business it's about the law involved which is company law there is also an income tax angle to it and if it is the foreign entity involved or so then again there are various aspects of foreign exchange management act also uh, so that's why this restructuring or merger amalgamation there is a lot of lot of things to do in that we move to the next section which is uh, 62 4 uh, so i'll i'll run uh, fast on this section because this is again a, an appeal against government order of government basically if you have taken a loan from government and um, uh, there is some uh, the pick and uh, the, if the government requires or if because you are unable to pay and then there is uh, the debentures or loans have been converted into equity and the company is not happy with that then the company can appeal to the nclt and uh, so it is about uh, that uh, a bit rarely used section i would say uh then there is section 71 subsection 9 and then there is subsection 10 so this is applicable to debentures so debentures as you all know that uh debentures are also issued by the company and uh, in case uh, there is a debentures which are being issued uh then as you know if for example if a company has issued prospectus to public Uh, or say its mem- uh, members exceeding uh, 500 for the subscription that is a debentures uh, then there is a requirement under the companies act that you need to appoint a debenture trustee and uh, of course there is a role of debenture trustee that he has to take essential steps so that he can protect the interest of the debenture holders because that is a sole 
the reason why the debenture trustee is being appointed so if at any point of time he believes that or he comes to a conclusion that the assets of the company are not sufficient or if they are not they are likely to become insufficient and basically the principal amount uh, for which they are being uh, tacked on that is not sufficient uh, then they can approach the nclt the debenture trustee can approach the nclt and of course there are a lot of documentation related to that uh, which you have to show uh, we have to attach to the petition also so basically it is a remedy being give, provided to a debenture trustee and again 7110 is also uh, about redemption of the debenture so uh, if after uh, the redemption of uh, date of the or uh, debentures the company does not pay the redem uh, the debenture holders or the interest which is accrued on the debentures and if that is not being paid by the company then of course you can approach nclt uh, with respect to that also and that is what 71 and 79 so this is again related to debentures and debentures uh, redemption and so on okay there is some question uh what is the remedy for companies not incorporated under companies act especially bpos to help your query um this is about uh, how how do you conclude that the bpos are not uh, incorporated under the companies act because uh, see there is also one thing that if it is a company then only certain remedies are available to you if it is not a company then you will not be able to avail those remedy under companies act because the definition of company itself says that company means a company which is incorporated under the companies act so if that is the definition then if you are a company then you can avail the remedies and again uh, there can be various aspects of business also like a sole proprietary uh, partnership but sole proprietorship partnership you if there is some remedy related to that this may not be applicable because again like i said these are more applicable to companies or individuals if like you are a debenture holder if you are a debenture holder in a company then you can have that remedy so like on so that's why you will have to be uh, more careful that what is a company what is a partnership what is a llp and then you have to identify what remedies you can avail if you are able to avail under the remedies under the companies act okay the next is uh, section 73 this is also a very important uh, section uh, this is about deposits uh, you must be hearing that there are a lot of companies which do avail deposits from public uh, large uh, publics at large so what if this public at large uh, whenever they have placed money in terms of the in with the company as deposits uh, and they have not been paid so this 734 is a very important remedy that if a company fails to repay the deposit uh, it can be any part of the deposit or any interest which is accrued on that deposit then the deposit holder uh, can apply to nclt and direct the company to pay such uh, amount uh, which is being uh, due to the deposit holder so this is again a very important uh, kind of uh, if you see these are all related debentures uh, so if you see there is a lot of interest of public involved and that is why the remedy is also that you can go to nclt and avail these remedies because of non payment of debentures non payment of deposit non uh, payment of interest on the debentures on deposits and so on so that's why this is uh, most people are sometimes not aware of such remedies and that's why they are not able to utilize such remedies so that is a very important thing which i wanted to highlight so then this is about a uh, uh, default on agm now as you are aware that uh, agm that is annual general meeting which is required to be uh, held by the company every finance after the closure of every financial year so if you if you are aware 6 months is the closure of time within which you have to close your accounts and the agm has to be conducted uh, for a financial year but if unfortunately such agm is not being conducted then what are the options uh, so if a default is made in holding the agm of a company then you can avail remedy 
uh, and uh, go to the NCLT for that matter. And an application can help you. And uh, sometimes this is also a very typical remedy where there are uh, two groups involved. And uh, the quorum is a very important aspect in such kind of cases because if there is a quorum requirement, quorum comes from obviously the Companies Act or if your articles has any provision specific to that. So if there are investors or there are JV partners uh, which are uh, as a shareholders in the company, then meeting this quorum is a very important because then it, if it is not a valid quorum, then your uh, AGM may not be possible. So if this is the case, what happens is sometimes the AGM quorum is not being attained and that's why the uh, so one group is say not attending the not willing to attend the AGM. So say the notice of the AGM has been dispatched and uh, the the one group is not attending the AGM and say your agreement JV agreement which is incorporated in the articles of association says that uh, for a um, AGM to be valid both the JV partners authorized representative should be attending the uh, AGM. So your financial statements are ready, everything is ready, but just that the other JV partner is not attending the AGM despite the notice and your quorum is not getting fulfilled. So in such cases, you can approach the NCLT and call upon that this AGM be conducted because there are also repercussions if your AGM is not conducted on time, then obviously you're not able to file your financial statements. Nowadays, there is a penalty, uh, Heavy penalty if you do not file your annual financial statements with the registrar of companies. And plus, if uh, this keep on happening for years, then there is a disqualification also, which can attract to the directors because of non-filing of annual filing uh, state, uh, financial statements. So if you see, there is a huge repercussions on just one activity that your AGM is not being conducted. So in such cases, you can make an application uh, to the NCLT and make uh, direct the uh, uh, company to call the convene the AGM and in that case uh, the orders can be also such that even one member uh, of the company's in person or proxy is present then that can be deemed uh, to constitute a valid AGM so such orders can also be there and that is why it is very important that you are aware of this provision. And again, uh, 981, 97.1, 98.1 is about, uh, 97.1 is about AGM and 98.1 is about uh, meeting other than AGM. So there are various uh, matters required under the Companies Act which require shareholders approval. So if the shareholders approval is required, obviously for that you need to convene an extraordinary general meeting. Uh, and if that extraordinary general meeting, again, the same quorum and all those things would be applicable that the shareholders should attend that meeting. So again, if there are some circumstances by which uh, this EOGM, that is extraordinary general meeting is not being attended, then you can again approach NCLT and uh, obtain a direction to call such EGM also. So that is when uh, you should, when there is such roadblocks, uh, these remedies can be availed. Uh, then uh, there is 119 uh, for subsection 4. Uh, so inspection of minutes books or directing a copy thereof to be sent forthwith to a person requiring it. Now, this is a very unique provision. And again, this can be used also in the cases of operation mismanagement. Because what happens sometimes, the there are say there are two parties involved, two shareholder groups involved. And one group is not letting, they had all the access of the physical documents and they had all access of all the records. And in that, say the shareholders meeting, uh, what has passed now, if there is an increase in capital, uh, all these resolutions or, or the minutes books, you don't have access to the minutes book. Then of the general meeting, then you can approach the NCLT and the NCLT can pass an order and NCLT can direct that the inspection of minutes books or a copy thereof to be uh, sent to the member. So that is a very important thing which you should be knowing so that if there are such cases where you, because as per the Companies Act, a member is authorized uh, to inspect uh, the, uh, the minutes of general meetings which are kept at the registered office of the company. He can uh, send a request and within seven working days, his request has to be accepted by the company. 
So if this request is being refused, then you know what should be done. Uh, then 130, 131 is about, 130 is basically application for reopening of books of accounts. Uh, it is basically about the authorities if they believe that uh, there is something fishy, there is something fraudulent about it, uh, then uh, say uh, central government or income tax, SEBI, they can approach under 131. And 131, one is about application by company for voluntary. So if the company believes that uh, there is something um, now the books of accounts has to be kept in accordance uh, with the uh, sections of Companies Act, which is section 129. And uh, then there is a board of directors report under section 134 of the Companies Act. So there are uh, prescribed ways in which how your account should be maintained. And there is schedule three, which shows how your balance sheet financial statement should be prepared then what should go in your director's report? All these are being mentioned in section 134 of the Companies Act and 129. Now, if unfortunately, after finalization of your accounts, filing it with the registrar of companies, you come to know that there is some entries of your financial statements are missing or some stock has been missed out or some CSR reporting, which you did some CSR, but that entries were missed out in your uh, balance sheet and financial statements that, that has not been reflected in your financial statements. Then the only option uh, which is left out to you is apply uh, uh, for voluntary revision of financial statements. And uh, here, of course, uh, it will not be very plain simple or it would not be that easy uh, because the tribunal also gives notice to the central government, income tax authorities and uh, if they have to have any representations, they can make before passing off any order by the tribunal. And of course, there is a requirement of advertising and all. So this is not a very easy process at all. Uh, and uh, most of the time it is uh, considered as a last thing that if uh, that which can be availed of. Uh, but uh, yes, if there is a major uh, lapses in the financial statement and major miss outs, which have been uh, done in the financial statements or by presenting the financial statements or the board of directors report, then you can do avail this remedy under section 131, subsection one. Then I will uh, quickly uh, go through 141. So I will be just spending a minute or so for not sending the representation to members. Uh, so this is basically uh, with reference to auditor where if the tribunal is satisfied that, you know, that, uh, so whenever there is a, a removal of auditor or this is also applicable in case of a director or removal of auditor or an appointment of auditor, which is other than the retiring auditor, uh, then they have the authority to uh, provide representations, if any, to be sent to the members. But if it is believed, if the tribunal is satisfied that this representation, which has to be sent is being misused by such persons, then uh, then the uh, tribunal may ask that this representation need not be sent and uh, the representation need not be read out at the meeting. So that is an important provision. Uh, if there is an abuse of the process or abuse of the powers given either to an auditor and there is also one section with reference to director where a director is being removed and he is allowed to give representation but if that representation is such that it is defamatory and all those things, uh, then the uh, company or a director can approach the tribunal and they can seek remedies under this act. So that is 144 and 145. So NCLT uh, COMO2 also can, uh, if it is satisfied that the auditor, whether directly or indirectly acted in defraudulent manner or abated, uh, to change the auditor. So this is about change in auditor if there is such kind of thing where an auditor is involved in any fraud or so, then uh, NCLT Suomoto or obviously by a person concerned uh, can remove the auditor also of the company or change the auditor. Uh, then we come to 169.4. This is again like what I talked about the director, uh, the same that if there is a removal of director and there is a representation being made, uh, but that representation need not be read if NCLT is satisfied, it gives an order that the rights conferred are being abused. Uh, and it's and the person is just uh, seeking needless publicity and, you know, for defamatory matters. 
then uh, that can be uh, taken up to NCLT and NCLT can pass such orders that this need not be presented or sent to the members. Then 213 is about investigation into affairs of the company. So this investigation into affairs of the company is also a very uh, important section. Um, so if it is, if there is an application of not less than 100 members or you know, members holding not less than one tenth of the over total voting power, or if the company is not having share capital uh, of one fifth of the persons, uh, then there, the most important requirement here is that they have to support it by the evidences that they have good reasons for seeking such investigation or uh, into the affairs of the company. So the the reasons typically here can be that business is being conducted, you know, to defraud the members or defraud the creditors, uh, or it is for an unlawful purposes, or uh, the persons who are in, uh, who are involved in formation are guilty of any fraud or misconduct. So, if such kind of reasons are being you are able to support it by evidence, uh, then you can avail the remedy and you can uh, go approach NCLT and for investigation into the affairs of the company. Then 213, 2118, I will just uh, skip that because it is about uh, application to tribunal for, in, uh, so 218, sorry, is about uh, if there is an employee involved and if there is protection required. So that is about 218 and uh, 222 also I will skip. This is the main areas where a very key aspect of NCLT practice. Compromise arrangement amalgamation. It is, like I said, a chapter in itself. And there are various ways by which like a merger, amalgamation or two, three companies merging into one or a demerger, which is there where one unit is getting off. These are the areas where there is a lot of case laws which are available and a lot of case laws which are applicable and uh, how the way these transactions are being structured in compromises and arrangements, uh, amalgamation is a very interesting facet. Uh, from an NCLT perspective, it can be procedural in nature, but if you are involved as an advocate or as a company secretary or a chartered accountant, right from the way the scheme of merger or demerger uh, is being drafted, then that is something which you become very much aware uh, because the rest becomes very procedural in nature that how to file an application with the NCLT, uh, then say how the notice of uh, how the creditors meeting or if it is a shareholders meeting, how that can be conveyed, the scrutinizer being appointed. Uh, so uh, then again, the order of NCLT, then the stamp duty. So the rest becomes very procedural aspect to it. But Considering from right from drafting the uh, uh, scheme of merger or amalgamation of, and again, like I told you, it is not just company law, it is company law, it can be a uh, stamp act which is involved, it is uh, income tax which is involved and other aspects. Plus, in case of merger amalgamation, uh, there is also a lot of employees. Now, for example, what will happen with the employees? of those companies and so there are various stakeholders which are being involved plus there is a lot of income tax angle to it also so these are uh, very much subject in itself and uh, that is why a very lucrative scope of practice also uh, of compromise arrangements and amalgamation because the section is also uh, if you see the drafting of that section it can cover many aspects to its ambit what is arrangement itself is a word and it's itself can contain n number of transactions okay so that is about a uh, compromise arrangement uh, again 241 242 is also a very important uh, section and a lot of cases come to nclt uh, with reference to operation mismanagement so this operation mismanagement uh, there is a section uh, under section 244 also which which shows that you know, who can avail this ready? So, so I'm just one shareholder having one share. I will not be able to avail remedies under this act. But yes, there can be exceptions and it can be up to the tribunal. So if you must have heard about Tata versus Cyrus Mystery, then again, in that case, how the uh, how this 
applicability was being discussed so all there are many ample case laws with reference to operation and mismanagement because the word operation and mismanagement is not defined under companies act but it is just uh, by way of various case laws that you come to know that what is an operation what is mismanagement and so on so there are various case laws that what can amount to operation and what can not amount to operation also so if if i have to give you examples that what are the typical ways of what can amount to operation is see uh, allotment of shares by directors in a manner uh, so the shareholder so basically the shares are being allotted in such a manner that uh, uh, the shareholders one group is say pushed into minority or like i said continuous refusal by a company to register the shares or if it is with an ulterior motive you know to gain the control over the affairs of the company or passing of re- uh, resolution in a very systematic manner that you know the uh, the the other party does not have the remedy or they are uh, secluded in a way that they are not able to avail the remedies under this act or registration of transfer uh, so this is by various case laws i'm trying to help you this has to not been taken in isolation but of course with the facts of each case this will differ but just to give a, you a general idea about it uh, and of course uh, what will not amount to operation if i have to give you few examples so in this case it can be uh, say if there is persistent losses in the company and uh, the directors are acting dutiful in terms of as per section 166 that the duties of director they are fulfilling everything but because of some business decisions the company is suffering into losses then just because the company is suffering into losses you cannot avail remedy under this act so when you can avail a remedy under this act is also a matter of prime importance now earlier there was section under companies act 1956 wherein there were that if the director did not attend three consecutive board meetings then he used to vacate the office now the provision is different in companies act 2013 but it is about one year uh, so if this is being systematically done such that the director does not attend the meeting and then he is vacated uh from the office of director so there are ample case laws which talked about that how systematically a person is being uh, pushed into minority so that he is not able to exercise control over the company or because the resolutions in a company are passed either by way of a uh, board of directors are being passed by majority or unless articles provide that the consent is required if there is an investor or so and in case of general meetings obviously it is an ordinary resolution or a special resolution so uh, this tar- this numbers make a lot of difference that like whether you have that number of shareholding so uh, are you in a position to obstruct the ordinary resolution are you in a position to obstruct the special resolution of the company and so on so these uh, triggers that's why again the knowledge of companies act is very important that what is your stake in the company and what are your rights associated to it and how can you exercise your control and what remedies you can avail uh, this becomes a matter of crucial thing in case of operation mismanagement cases there is a lot of due diligence which you should be doing because sometimes you do not know the entire facts and that's why there is a lot of Uh, understanding that what has exactly happened, what how were the understanding, plus there is also a concept of quasi partnership which is being considered in such kind of cases. So those things are to be considered as a lawyer, as a company secretary, as a chartered accountant, as a cost accountant, while you are representing such cases. So that's why again, like I said, this is a topic in itself, uh, and then I'll just move on to. uh the last point class action suits again uh, this is a newly introduced provision under the companies act 2013 it is yet to test its way that how this section can be utilized in a very effective manner and 252 is also a very important uh, provision which i would just take a minute or two to explain so basically this 252 uh, is about uh, a- appeal to the appeal by a person aggrieved by an order of registrar notifying a company as resolved under section 248 so uh, you must be aware that 
uh, there is a lot of hue and cry that the companies, uh, there are a lot of companies which are being removed uh, by the registrar from the, uh, from, uh, from the, its database because there are certain restrictions which are being put and they have not been fulfilled by the company. So, uh, say for example, if the registrar has reasonable reason to believe that uh, the company has failed to commence its business within one year of its incorporation, or uh, say the company is not carrying on in any business or on operations for a period of two immediately preceding financial years, and plus it has not also obtained the status of a dormant company. Plus, say example, there can be other reasons uh, that the subscribers now whenever their company is incorporated the subscribers assume that this is the amount which they are going to pay towards the subscription and towards the capital of the company and if they do not pay that amount and uh, a declaration so there is also a declaration which is required under the companies act that once this and this is a newly introduced provision in the companies act 2013 that once you uh, that subscription capital is has come into the bank account of the company then the company can commence the operations of the uh, company uh, but uh, this if this is not fulfilled so the commencement of business has not been filed with the register of companies because say the subscribers did not put the money in the bank account which they had agreed at the time of incorporation or there can be other reason that company is not carrying on the business as revealed after the physical verification carried out. So there is a registered office which is required to be mentioned. And if there is a, if the, it is being proved that no, there is no business conducted over there, uh, then, uh, then the registrar will have, can avail this remedy and they can strike off the, basically the company uh, in that case. Now, uh, this order can be in uh, this can be appealed uh, by the aggrieved person uh, in the NCLT, uh, but the reasons have to be very strong in that case. Uh, so the reasons can be generally uh, uh, that you know that uh, the grounds of revival. What we typically say is, say for example, the company owns an immovable property, so it should not be uh, the uh, dissolution order should not take place or. Uh, say the company has filed IT returns or GST returns or say there are transactions in the bank account. So the evidence will play a lot of role in such kind of cases. But trust me, this is also very a uh, lucrative option because nowadays there have been a lot of companies which are being striked off and they receive the notice. And if it is a running company, then there are employees, uh, then there is stake involved, there is the creditors, there can be creditors. Uh, and so on. So, uh, plus the company would have various licenses. So, if it's a food company, it can have FSAI license and so on. So, this can immediately get affected if such notice is being issued by the registrar uh, under Section 248. So, that's why the remedy which can be availed, availed is to revive the company, you can approach NCLT. And uh, like I said, but the evidences have to be strong to that effect to show that, yes, the company is running and it, it will be uh, basically the, not in the favor of such kind of activities if the company is being uh, dissolved under Section 248. So that is something. And if there are, there can be other miscellaneous application for compounding of certain offenses. So if that can also be approached to NCLT. So it's like a remainder section where, where you can approach the NCLT. So that is something uh, which I would like to share. And I would like to take some couple of slides on the petitions because there is one question about while drafting a petition under 241, what important points should keep in mind? Sure. So these are the important forms uh, under NCLT. That NCLT one is the primary form. So basically, uh, there is a very prescribed format for this that uh, the details of the application, uh, description, and then jurisdiction of bench, limitation. Then obviously the facts of the case are to be said, what are the reliefs you are seeking, and of course the payment of the fee for the petition or application. So that details also come in uh, there. So that is in NCLT 1. Uh, NCLT 4 is about the general headings that, you know, like, for example, uh, it should be every 
petitioner application should say before the national company law tribunal bench so if it's a mumbai bench or so and in the matter of companies act uh, and in the matter of say xyz private limited so the name of the company so that is a prescribed thing under this nclt4 which that the, what should be the general headings for proceeding so these are the general headings which should be there then affidavit verifying petition i guess you all can understand and uh, a memorandum of appearance is basically if you are a ca practicing ca cs uh, i see the uh, cwa then you will have to file this nclt 12 or you can file the vakalat nama also so that is possible this is the typical way that every appeal or petition uh, it should be in english language if there is some documents which are not in english then you should provide a translated copy so if you have documents which are in your uh, local colloquial language then that should be a uh, translated copy should be provided uh, of course the petition application should be fairly legibly typewritten uh, printed in double line so this is the prescribed format in which you are all petition application should go with nclt uh, the cost title like i said shall uh, always say that it is before the national company law tribunal and the bench uh, should be also specified yeah and again you should not just write a general uh, paragraph it should be divided in due paragraphs it should be consecutively numbered so that even if a judge asks you something you can refer the para uh, and so on so a para just a big paragraph should be avoided uh, the dates become very important in the matter of facts uh, so these dates uh, if you are uh, mentioning it shakka and so then you have to mention it in the gregorian calendar dates also uh then of course uh, each party description address the name of the parties if there are in, uh, any um, many uh, should be numbered consecutively and a separate line should be allotted to the name and description of each party so these are the typical uh, pointers with reference to uh, how the petitions and applications uh, should be drafted